Again, everybody, thank you for coming this evening. Welcome to the Mid-Michigan Roundtable. My name is Ken Cavula, and I represent the Mid-Michigan chapter. Uh, we've had to move the table. We had some serious technical difficulties a week ago, so for the first time ever, we had to cancel our session and reschedule it uh, for another date. So this is actually the October Roundtable, one week late. It actually got uh, better. We're glad okay. <laughs> we're glad to have you all here, and especially uh, glad to have the folks from mid-Michigan here. Uh, folks, you're the reason that we do this in the first place. Of course, we're glad to have all of our guests from all over the country. And without any further ado, it's only two of us in the back room. It looks like we've been joined. Aha, Kim has joined us in the back room. Kim yeah. Butcher uh, from uh, down in the extreme southwestern uh, corner of Indiana, Evansville, Indiana. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce my good friend Mark Robertson, and he'll start our program by leading you through some of the things we, we do on a regular basis here at the roundtable. Go on, Mark. Well, well, thanks, Ken, and, and welcome, everybody. Um, our apologies in advance. Hugh McManus did get called away and will be unable to join us, but Kim is sneaking in the back door, so she may have some input here tonight. Um, uh, I'll just second what I said a few minutes ago. I think it got better because we actually finished up our task of identifying some interesting small companies to study, and I think the audience will go away with some interesting ideas to scratch their heads over and some potential investment uh, stocks to study for potential opportunity so again welcome i think that'll be a that'll be a good story for us to tell in the next 15 minutes also about why we felt the need to develop the list in the first place mark oh absolutely you know it's it's something that we have taught uh, for many years and, and one of the other things we're going to talk about here in a minute is the performance of the tracking portfolio is so strong so i'm i'm almost giddy we can almost have a Kansas City Royals parade when you see what, what, what's happened here over the last several days, but let's get some of the housekeeping out of the way first. Again, this is our end of October presentation, so a couple jack-o'-lanterns did sneak in there, but we do have some official business here. We will talk about real companies in real time. Everything that we do here is to demonstrate a method or a process. You could even call it a philosophy of long-term investing. Everything is done in an educational demonstration mode and no investment recommendation is ever intended. Please do your own homework. Um, as you will hear in a few minutes, Ken owns half the companies we're going to be talking about. So we'll, we'll, just, do it. we'll just do a, a few of them, Mark. A few of them. Okay. You know, I, I think the list would be shorter, which ones he doesn't own. But uh, again, we could own some positions in those also. So again, think education. And again, it's for illustrative purposes only. If you'd like to be added or if you have a friend who would like to be added to the reminder list, that is Ken's uh, spouse, Natalie, ncavula1 at comcast.net. She takes care of that and gets the, the reminders out to everybody. And my email there is in case you have any questions or would like any follow-up. Here's our standing agenda. Again, we've got the jack-o'-lantern there. This is officially our October session, even though we're a couple days into November. Again, a big welcome to those of you that are maybe joining us for the first time and an equally big welcome to those of you that are returning. Uh, we'll spend a few minutes with the scoreboard and a quick reminder as to what we're trying to do here. And in this case, we definitely got tricked, not, excuse me, treated, not tricked, as we'll show here in a minute. And then Ken and I are gonna spend a few minutes on a little bit of an extended session um, talking about best small companies. You know. It's urgently important to have small, medium, and large companies in your portfolios. That's part of the reason that this portfolio has done so well. It's part of the reason that many of the portfolios out there in the community do well because small, medium, and large, that all of the above type investing that we talk about all the time is extremely important. So we usually uh, set aside October as a month to uh, celebrate small companies and explore and discover small company investing opportunities because we know we want enough growth in the portfolio. Uh, we'll talk about a challenge a little bit. Uh, we had one done for us. Cyberonics will disappear from the tracking portfolio. We'll take a look at that. I'm going to present Forward Air, ticker symbol FWRD. Ken is going to present Polaris. Uh, that's a repeat selection. And Hugh was unable to join us. So we probably still will have a cage match, one-on-one, -on -one, man to man battle of Polaris versus Forward Air. At the, at the end of the session. 
here's our quick reminder as to what we're trying to do here. We've been doing this for over five years. We get together on a monthly basis, uh, whether it's the, the four of us or guest knights or even guest damsels. We make selections. We try to identify uh, an investment opportunity that has more than intrigued us and uh, could be an interesting stock study opportunity. That's what we're trying to bring to you. We like to, to bring you ideas that will outperform the market. It's that plain and simple. We'd like to see the collection of ideas outperform the Wilshire 5000 by five percentage points over the long term. And we'll take a look at how we're doing there. And we'd also like to have at least 60% of our selections outperform the market since, since at the time we select them. So here's our Kansas City Royals parade. Um, the portfolio is actually up. Uh, approximately 13% during October. Just, it's staggering. Um, I mean, the market was good to virtually everybody, but it was extra good to the the selections made in the in the round table. I mean, that's uh, that's quite a bump there on the right hand side. We're we're up to a, a relative return of 3.3%, and uh, we're again we're shooting for five. Again, the definition of relative return is to simply take what the actual rate of return is on the selections that we make over the years and compare that versus a benchmark. So the actual versus the benchmark, in this case, the benchmark we use is the Wilshire 5000 um, mutual fund. So we're beating that now by almost uh, three and a half percent. Again, our long-term target is to try to get to, to five, be somewhere in that shaded area between five and 10, but we really would like to see five. And uh, amazingly enough, our outperformance accuracy, 63% are, are now outperforming. So let's hope that uh, that continues. So Ken, take a bow. You've got uh, several in there contributing to that. Mark, I'm going to interrupt you for just a second. Susan, your hand is in the air. Uh, I don't see any icon next to your name, which means you probably are on the phone. Uh, go ahead. If you can talk to us, give it a try. This is probably an inadvertently raised hand. Then I'm going to lower the hand for Susan. And Mark, you can continue, OK? Uh, we might just remind that anybody, if you do have a question and you don't have a microphone or we just want to be bashful, you can actually enter a question in the questions tab. And uh, uh, Kim and Ken will be monitoring that. So you can actually get to us there. So again, but strong stuff, uh, stuff that we would call, almost have a party over. Here's where you can find the tracking dashboard. These are the 20 most influential stocks in the tracking portfolio right now. What we typically do, or what we always do, is invest $1,000 each time a company is selected. That's why you see this uh, insert here after the title. The whole dashboard's available at that long public link. You do not have to be a subscriber at Manifest Investing to access that. You can just type in that link and you can see all of the stocks that have been selected over time. But uh, the repeat selections are the ones that actually appear on this most influential list. Again, keep in mind, we're keeping track of the collective performance of all these. These are the ones that affect that the most. Cognizant technology has been selected 12 times, as you can see up here at the top. Let me grab a pen and do my Madden thing here. Uh, up here at the top, 12 times of Cognizant's been selected. So $12,000 has been invested into Cognizant that is now worth, wow, $21,000. So that's actually had quite a good bump, you know, over the years as it's been selected. Many of those selections were made by Psy, but there's a, a number of selections. Apple has crept up the list. You can see that that was selected last month uh, by me. And uh, eight times selection, so $8,000 invested in Apple is now worth $13,000. Um, you can see that Illumina was selected last month by Ken and, and added doubled down by the audience. So that one's got a two time selection. Uh, McGraw Hill Financials actually been in there three times now. So that's just on the verge of making this list. But there's really some fascinating names from top to bottom. In fact, yeah, the, Mark, the third one and the fourth one on the list are, are really interesting. They've both been selected five times and they're both near doubles. Uh, it's 5,000 in and Microsoft is worth over 10 and Priceline is worth uh, nine plus. So we're, we're looking at, at near doubles. The only one in the top five that, that seems to be causing us an issue right now is Qualcomm. Uh, and Qualcomm has been selected uh, more times than I would like to remember, nine times if you look at the legend up on top. 
and it's not even worth nine thousand dollars so we do have one loser among the top five but we also have two that uh, have almost doubled and Cognizant is on its way to doing the same thing. I'm very pleased with the performance of some of these top stocks here. Yeah, and Qualcomm is is going through some rather intense challenges. So I mean, I, I wouldn't shovel dirt on it, but at the same time, it's uh, it's got some um, fairly significant challenges. But I mean, going down the list, there's some companies we're going to talk about here in the next few minutes. Mesa Labs. Uh, well, Mesa Labs, I believe, is a three time selection, or is it just two? It's a three-time selection, Mark, so we have more than a double on Mesa Labs, yeah. And, you know, Mesa Labs and Neogen is also on this list, I believe, at least it was. Um, these these are our poster children for relatively small companies that have up straight and parallel characteristics. And uh, you can find small companies. Ken is going to be talking about that in a few minutes. Uh, you can find uh, Mark, here's, here's NIC on the list. That's eGov for the ticker. Uh, it's another one of our small ones. It's not doing, it's not doubling, but it's certainly well ahead of the four times it's been chosen. Uh, so we we do have some some small companies making our mm -hmm. our leaderboard here even. But first and foremost, I mean the the portfolio does stack up pretty well. Um, just taking it through a quick look at the overall portfolio. Now we've left out a whole bunch of companies that are right in here. Um, but the overall quality of the portfolio is strong at 84.6. Again, we like to see anything above 80. The, rel the, the, the return forecast is just short of 11%. We would like to see that a little bit higher, up around 12 or so. But probably most importantly, the, the overall growth rate of the portfolio is checking in at 10. We'd like to see it add up to about 11. The only way to do that is to continue to select smaller, faster growing companies as contributors to the overall portfolio, and that, that is a subject we'll cover tonight. But that 10.2% is is okay. Uh, we're getting a question about Cyberonics, Mark, so maybe we should deal with what we're going to do with Cyberonics. Well, that's, that's a good segue, isn't it? Go ahead and yeah. drag, Ken. Well, this is a, a company that I presented a, a while ago. Um, you know, uh, small companies in your portfolio don't always have to end up being medium-sized companies or large companies. Many times, great small companies uh, end up disappearing because they're bought up by the big guys. And usually, when a company is bought up, uh, you're getting a pretty decent return uh, on your money. So here's Cyberonics being bought up. Uh, it was currently trading at around, I don't know, $68, $69. There it is up in the corner, $69.09. And once the buyout was announced, uh, my philosophy has always been to take the easy money, uh, make the sale, and move on and look for something else that has a really good potential attached to it. Usually closing these deals takes a uh, a relatively long period of time and during that period of time between when the deal is announced and when the deal is finally closed uh, the money uh, invested in whatever the stock is tends to be fairly dead money it might go up another quarter or fifty cents or maybe even another dollar uh, but essentially it's going to be fairly flat and the price of the stock is going to hover around what's being offered by the acquiring company so uh, I think it's a great time for us to pat ourselves on the bat about, back about Cyberonics and close the positions out. Uh, I think we have two positions in Cyberonics, right, Mark? That is correct. The audience did uh, agree with you, so you both get a, a huge feather. One of the things I like about the, what the graphic that you're seeing on the screen here is can, you can take and put all the number crunching aside. This is a Finance Yahoo graph where we created on the day of the selection. Uh, back, I believe, in September of last year. You can see it on the far left here. Put them, basically input it at the same time. And uh, what you're actually looking at here is a graphical representation of relative return because the relative return is the difference between these two numbers. The actual performance of the stock is 37.4% since the time of selection, whereas the Wilshire 5000, which is the red line, we use this mutual fund to emulate the, to track the Wilshire 5000. That's gone up 4%. So again, uh, the selection by Ken and the audience has gone up 37. The Wilshire 5000 has gone up 4. Uh, 
we like that. That's a that, that's a good thing. And you're literally looking at relative return for this particular decision that was made. So pretty cool stuff. We good on that, Ken? Any so questions outstanding? It just there's only two votes uh, going on, Mark, yours and mine. So I vote to close the position out. How about you? I'm good with it. I mean, it stopped trading on the 15th of October, so. Okay, so out we go. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about our educational topic for tonight. I think it's one that will, uh, it helps everybody. It helps Ken and I do this every year when we do this, and the uh, audience seems to enjoy it too. Um, we were advised a few weeks ago that the Forbes Best Small Companies that has come out for 36 years, and we have always looked at it. We have, you know, years of results going back uh, 10, 12 years where we've looked at it as a community was being discontinued or, or given a hiatus. I hope they're just taking the year off. They switched it to a feature on private equity stuff, which, uh, again, I don't, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but that's what Forbes has decided to do. So when I advised Ken of that, so well, maybe maybe the thing we ought to do is just kind of do what they did and add our own wrinkles to it. So I'll let Ken describe what we decided to do to generate our version of the Forbes Best Small Company list. Uh, I, I think well, it was uh, interesting. It was a sad day in the Kabula household when when I found out that Forbes was not going to publish this Best Small Companies list. I had used this list for oh I don't know as many as ten or twelve years to to come up with really good ideas, really good solid ideas uh, about small companies that were flying under the radar and that we we weren't necessarily even covering in manifest investing and that I wasn't seeing when I searched through value line sheets and things like that. Uh, well, without that list, uh, we decided we might have enough data uh, to create our own list. So we decided to set some criteria down, uh, and we wanted the criteria to be easily understood by uh, our investing audience, the community that comes to the round table and that we talk to on a regular basis. So we start out by saying that uh, our definition of a small company was going to have revenues less than a billion dollars. Now, I know that's a little bit different from Better Investing's uh, definition, but I also know that better investing is rethinking this particular number. Uh, I've been in contact with people in the education department at better investing, and I'm not so certain that our one billion number is going to be far off the mark once the new better investing investors handbook comes out. Uh, so we said small to us, less than one billion in revenues, and we have been telling folks for years that George Nicholson suggested that revenues for a small company were usually in excess of 12%, that that was the benchmark for a small company. So we decided to back that up just a touch, and we said not only do we want revenues less than a billion, but let's look for anticipated sales growth going forward uh, in the neighborhood of double digits. So we wanted 10% or better. Uh, we also wanted to eliminate some of the extremely small companies. So we said, let's set a floor on these companies at $50 million. Now, a company that's generating only 50 or 60 or $70 million in revenues is still extremely small, but we knew that there were uh, many, many companies that were putting out revenues less than 50 million, and we decided to exclude them. Uh, that's the same kind of, of uh, method that Forbes was using in pulling together its list. Uh, we also wanted to not consider penny stocks, so we chose an arbitrary $5 number, and we said the stock should be trading at least at $5 or more. And uh, we were going to try to take our list after we did the initial uh, look through, and we were going to try to sort it by manifest quality rating and come up with the 50 best from the list of companies that fit those first four criteria. We also were going to do the same thing that Forbes had traditionally done for all of the years that it published the list, and that was to exclude asset-based businesses. Now, that's a kind of uh, a, 
higher level vocabulary, so let's uh, talk about it in real simple terms. Essentially, we've excluded anything that bases its business on collecting assets and storing them. So we're talking about banks, we're talking about savings and loans, thrifts, we're talking about insurance companies, uh, we're talking about asset managers, uh, such as mutual funds, uh, things like that. And that excludes uh, from the consideration most of the companies in the financial sector. It still does leave us with companies like Visa or Credit Acceptance or MasterCard. Now those uh, Visa and MasterCard definitely aren't small companies, but these that, that handle assets, uh, we were uh, deciding to keep in the, the uh, mix to start with, and it also in does include companies like Brown & Brown or Mc Marsh & McLennan. Uh, those are insurance brokers, not insurance companies. So uh, we essentially set these standards. They're very, very similar to the Forbes standards. And then all we wanted to do at that point was to reduce the list to 50. Our stated goal between the two of us was to try to come up with a list that would give you at least 25 good ideas out of the 50 companies that we put on the list. We also wanted to make sure that the list had some names that you hadn't heard of before, and we wanted those names that you hadn't heard of before to look fairly good on the visual analysis on an SSG. So we wanted to make sure that we were looking at, at lines that were up straight and parallel. You've heard me say at this program time and time again that you should expect from your small companies exactly the same things that you expect from your large companies. <coughs> Excuse me, and that's what we're trying to show you. So Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you <coughs> because I need a glass of water. Yeah, it sounds like you need to take a drink, a solid, celebratory drink of champagne. So again, we tried to emulate the Forbes criteria as best we could. We added a couple tweaks to it. And I mean, they had things like price performance, return to shareholders as part of their, their best criteria. And we, we kind of left that out. Um, you know, and, and putting the growth target on there did do things like eliminate some of the water utilities, which, you know, you can have a $200 million revenue water company at, a, you know, three or 4% growth rate. Those are just not the type of companies we wanted to see in there. So we were able to do that. And so we, it also nudged us out to shop in a couple different areas that we have talked about in, in great detail over the years. You know, one being that, that blue handbook to the right, the Hoover's Handbook of Emerging Companies went through that and we found some companies we had not previously looked at that fit the criteria. A couple of them made the list. And the other thing that you may have seen us do if you're a Manifest Investing subscriber, we went through and described the most successful or best small company mutual funds. So one of the best in the business is listed up there at the top, Brown Capital Management Small Company Investors. You can see they've got a gold rating and five stars from Morningstar. What we did is we grabbed the, the 10 or 12 best companies that we could find and literally dove into their portfolios looking for unidentified companies that we were not yet covering to see if they would uh, qualify for the criteria and possibly end up on the list. One last thing before we flick the page for you. Again, we're not talking about return forecast here. We're talking about small as defined by these criteria and best um, by quality. So we weren't shopping for necessarily whether they were on sale or not. We just wanted to identify the best. We'll cover that separately. Um, high quality and uh, possibly on sale, we'll take a look at separately. Well, here's the second 25. We've this is the, we're going to actually stick to the 50 because what we found is when we put the companies in the hopper, um, ended up with a, a list of slightly more than 50, but we wanted to have a, a cutoff at a, you know, a good or excellent quality rating. So now in order to make this list, you would have to have a quality rating of 75. The list is sorted. I mean, it's screened by the company has to be within that sales range of annual revenue, so 50 to a billion. Um, there is one bogey on there. That's a bad number for number 50. Their annual revenues is actually 830 or so. And you can see that all of the, the sales growth forecasts are in the double digit range. 
So there are some return forecasts. We'll come back to that. But they are ranked in that final column from highest to lowest uh, return or excuse me, quality ranking. So it's a, an interesting list with some companies that are pretty high on our radar screens, but a few that are not. Uh, anything reach out and grab you, Ken, as you look down that list. Well, this is Kim. One thing uh, I can say, number 50 there, SS and C Technologies. Mm -hmm. That is in my local town. Uh, what The guy who founded that company um, went to a high school here, and he came back because that's uh, based out of Connecticut. And the uh, cost of uh, employees and doing everything is cheaper in Evansville, Indiana than it is in Connecticut. And what they do is all the auditing behind the scenes for uh, index funds and ETFs. So they do all the accounting for them. So that's a real sticky business. Yeah, I didn't, um, I didn't know you were going to come in on this one. We did, actually did put together a quick graphic on the company. And yeah, I mean, they do a lot of uh, number crunching stuff for the financial services industry. So it actually operates for the most part out of Evansville is what you're saying? Uh, it's based out of Connecticut, but they opened up an office here mm -hmm. and they just went into a bigger office building. Um, you know how you find a stock and you think, oh, I need to watch that? I found this stock when it was at 18 and the net last time I looked at it, it was like at 70. I went, dang one of those ones you forgot to go back and look at it again. Mm -hmm. Well, as, as you can see, the, that's a fairly attractive uh, visual analysis on the, on the guide there, and they they actually do a lot of work for a bunch of the money management firms, so pretty interesting. Mark, I'm going to answer or ask a few of the questions that have appeared. Uh, Don wants to know, what's the significance of the asterisk after the uh, name of a company? Yeah, the asterisk just simply means that it's not in the value line standard edition. So if it's in the standard edition, for example, Plantronics, there's no asterisk. But anybody else, it means it's either in the small and mid cap or it could be uncovered by value line. Okay, Kerpal wants to know if uh, SWI is on the list. Uh, he, he knows that an offer has been made to purchase the company, and do we have any thoughts on that? Oh, that's and, a great uh, question. Uh, go on, Mark. Why don't you try to answer that? Well, that's a great question. SWI is, is the ticker symbol for Solar Winds. Um, it would be smack dab in the middle of the top half of this list, but uh, it is in the middle of um, acquisition situation right now so we actually are gonna when we write up the the commentary the narrative on this uh, solar winds will just be simply be given one big huge honorable mention it's been a it's been on the Forbes list for several years and it's it's obviously part of many of our portfolios so that's a it's a great company that won't make our list because of that um, merger and acquisition transaction that's out there and again, we should repeat that, that we love it when our small companies get bought up. It usually means a significant premium to the price, uh, and there's nothing that says that you want to buy a small company and hold it until it becomes a huge company. If it gets bought out, that's, that's really all to the good, and you can put that money to work again in another small company then. Yeah, you, you know, uh, I started to speak, Mark, about number 41 because we've been talking about uh, Mercado Libre now since you and I visited Minneapolis at an investor's fair, uh, must be going on seven or eight years ago. Uh, Mercado Libre, for those of you that don't know anything about the company, is an Argentinian company, and they're essentially duplicating the business of uh, eBay and Amazon kind of all crushed and merged together. Uh, there were some serious uh, currency issues going on with Mercado Libre at various times. Uh, I happen to own this particular stock in uh, my wife's IRA account, and you can see that there's a projected average return of around 19% as calculated by Manifest Investing. Uh, when I do my own SSG on Mercado Libre, I get a very similar number, so I'm I'm quite pleased to see it on our list of the, the 50 best, and it's right beneath another one that my wife holds in her uh, IRA account. That's U.S. Physical Therapy. Uh, we've chosen U.S. Physical Therapy once or twice in our uh, uh, tracking portfolio, 
uh, my daughter happens to work uh, in a physical therapy office, and uh, this is a real rising service, I think, that as the population ages, uh, you're going to see the, the proliferation of physical therapy uh, uh, services all across the country. Uh, they're, they're just being uh, used by all kinds of doctors and by referrals from hospitals. In fact, some of the U.S., uh, some of the physical therapy systems are run by the hospitals, and USPH is a way to, to make a play uh, on that particular industry right now. Now, uh, be careful. The projected average returns only about 8%. That's about average in this market. Uh, do an SSG. Make sure that you, you think it's a buy before you go ahead and buy it. Uh, Mark's pulling up one now that I know he'd like to talk about. Go on, Mark. Well, I, I had to change the topic because my right uh, calf is throbbing as you talk about physical therapy. So <laughs> thanks, thanks to a tennis war wound. Here's one that I'd never heard of before. Ticker symbols HF. The company name is HFF. Uh, still don't know a whole lot about it other than uh, it's a commercial real estate company that does stuff. Uh, I assume that means they do brokerage and representation, some agency type activities. But, uh, you know, as you take a look at it, they, they obviously were crushed by the Great Recession, but they seem to have come out of it quite, quite well, quite strong. If, if there is a future in commercial real estate, these guys do seem to be doing pretty well. And, uh, Certainly the right-hand side of that graph qualifies for up straight and parallel and uh, looking at double digit returns on a company growing at 18%, you know, uh, fairly nominal PE ratios. And you know, just, just to, to demonstrate, uh, let me go back to that one and give the audience a look at what these guys actually do. Yeah, there's a Holiday Inn there, there's Stryker, that's the building out in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, obviously they have the property at Sawgrass. So these are some of the things that they're involved in that uh, are quite interesting. So commercial real estate, worth probably a closer look. Again, the takeaway in my opinion is the up straight and parallel nature of the right-hand side of that graph. Um, here's another one that uh, I used to work a lot with companies like Bechtel and Fleur Engineers and you know some of the companies that you'll find in the traditional areas, I'd never heard of this one, Argan. Now, they do they do engineering and construction type work for power plants. The picture that you see there is uh, the construction of a wind turbine. So they're in uh, all the conventional forms of power generation along with solar and wind. And again, that's gonna be bumpy because of the nature of the activities that they're involved with, but you could certainly stack this company up and compare them with you know the tilers and floors and all of those different kinds of companies that are in that line of work. Ken, this is one that you've talked about in the past. Uh, I still don't know exactly what they do, but uh, synchronous technologies, they do cloud stuff. Well, I'd have to study up on it a little bit, Mark, but I know that I've uh, studied this one in the past. Uh, it's never made a, a portfolio that I belong to, that I, that I own, uh, but it does have uh, something to do with the cloud, and I do know that uh, it uh, competes with companies like VMware, uh, uh, not directly, but the overlapping com competition. And I was intrigued uh, when I first looked at it by the nature of its lines. Uh, I, I just think you can't find anything straighter than what I'm looking at in these two uh, uh, revenue line and earnings per share line. Now, granted, uh, the company looks like it uh, it takes off after the Great Recession, so uh, didn't have a chance to participate in that downdraft. But what it's been doing since 2010 certainly looks interesting. And uh, again, my advice: study this one, find some competitors to the company, and then study the group as a whole. Because if this one's good, there might be another one that's even better mm -hmm. in the same industry. So why don't you take us through the top 25, Ken, since you own half of them. I was intrigued uh, by our top 25 list, and we didn't do anything to jigger it. But uh, remember that I'm involved in a number of model clubs, plus a family club, plus a personal portfolio, and two IRA portfolios. So that 
uh, means that uh, while there's a significant amount of overlap between those portfolios, I'm probably exposed to 60 or 70 stocks in all the portfolios that I have a, a, a piece of. I was surprised uh, when I counted down the top 25 and found that I owned nine of them. Uh, there's some really, really interesting, great companies on this list. Uh, tomorrow night, for example, stock number 11 uh, in the Better Investing Stock Up program. If you haven't registered for that, I would uh, suggest you might want to go to the Better Investing website and register for the Stock Up program. I'm going to be doing a full hour presentation on Proto Labs. Uh, this is one of my current favorites. Uh, I really am intrigued by what they do, and I'm intrigued by what they do because what they've basically done is take the job that my father held for almost 40 years, and they've made it obsolete. Uh, he was a machinist, a traditional machinist. He made uh, machines that, in turn, made light bulbs. Uh, for General Electric. I made all kinds of lighting equipment for General Electric, but he would be handed uh, a blueprint of a part that an engineer wanted, and then his job was to figure out how to make that part. Well, Proto Labs is doing the same thing, only it's doing it with machines and with computers and lasers and uh, all different kinds of of uh, cutting edge technology. I think you'll find the company to be extremely interesting if you were to study it yourself and check out that par value coming from Manifest. Uh, I will tell you that even a very conservative stock selection guide still gives a par in the uh, lower to mid-teen area. Uh, I also love the company Mesa Labs right beneath it. Uh, you might have remembered that we said it was in our top uh, holdings uh, in the tracking portfolio. Uh, Mesa Labs uh, makes all kinds of medical instruments, but it also makes instruments that are way outside the medical field. It makes a series of, of uh, sensors, for example, that are used by people that bottle carbonated beverages, and the sensors tell them how much pressure is underneath the cap so that they keep the beverage properly carbonated without blowing the top off as they ship it or as it sits on a shelf somewhere. Uh, up near the top, if you like auto parts, uh, and there's some great auto part companies out there, and the auto industry right now is just going gangbusters, take a deep dive and study Dorman products. Uh, you might be pleasantly surprised to see how classic uh, the SSG is for this particular company. And you might uh, be also surprised to find out that there's a lot of business, a lot of money to be made by doing things that don't sell directly to the major automakers throughout the world. Dorman Products sells most of its uh, material, most of the things that it manufactures, sells it to auto supply shops and uh, companies like O'Reilly Automotive or AutoZone or places like that. And then just uh, two more, uh, NIC, the number 14 on the list, eGov is the uh, ticker symbol. Uh, this is a, a great story about a company that is helping folks in state after state after state uh, enter a computer platform and do a lot of things in conversation with their state government that they used to have to go to Secretary of State's offices or places like that. EGOV sets up these portals and they do it in an extremely efficient way. Uh, I won't spoil the whole story, but it's a really great company to take a look at. And then one of the most recent purchases from one of my investment clubs uh, is Boston Beer. Uh, every now and then you need a refreshing uh, a beverage and Sam Adams, uh, which is the major uh, brew coming from Boston Beer, hits the spot. Uh, notice that uh, par value of 13.8. Uh, just a little bit ago, within the last month, that par value was even higher, and Sam Adams was a really good buy at that particular point. So, Mark, maybe you can pull off another three or four that you like off this list. Well, yeah, there's a, there's definitely a few community favorites on there, along with a couple new names. I mean, the Neogen fits right with Mesa Labs. 
I'm wondering if Kim has any that uh, jump off the list at her. She may. No, I can't say that I do. Um, I, I think the biggest one that struck me was SS and C. Yep. And C. That's a good story. And then, I mean, there's some other ones here. I mean, AZZ down towards the bottom and ANSS. I think both of those have been presented in some capacity by Matt uh, Spielman here. Francesca's came up in a presentation by uh, Nick Stratagos not too long ago. So, I mean, there are companies here that have appeared. I think that uh, our experience with Cognizant Technology and some of the other companies in that line of work suggest that, uh, you know, keeping on keeping an eye on companies like Sintel at number eight, along with NIC, as Ken was just talking, at number 14, and Luxoft, I don't know much about Luxoft, but uh, that's another one for some reason that I think Matt has talked about from time to time. These consulting companies, again, in the information business can be uh, can be quite rewarding to investors for the ones that do it well. And uh, again, this is, we think it's a pretty nice list. Again, the, the fact that that it is centered on, you know, our, our notion of quality and not some of the stuff that uh, Forbes used kind of makes it a little bit more speaking our language. I'm not using very good language here, but it, it this is kind of a, a list that is going to be consistent with and complementary to the type of things we go hunting for uh, because we are paying so much attention to the, the components of the quality rating. These are going to be more upstraight and parallel than your average smaller company. So we should find some uh, decent shopping opportunities. Um, Ballcam is another one that has a, been a community favorite for a long time. I know many of the investment clubs in the St. Louis area have uh, Ballcam, the ticker symbol BCPC at number two there. And I think with that, I'm gonna just go ahead and we'll, uh, we'll basically get the list out and be publishing some features on this kind of stuff as we, uh, as we roll it out, one of the things that I did notice as the list took shape is the vast majority of these companies have a financial health ratings from Morningstar. That's kind of a common thread that runs through many of these companies. And of course that helps their quality rate ranking, but uh, uh, very hi highly thought of by the team at Morningstar. So with that, what I, uh, go ahead. Mark, I wanted to just finish before we moved on by, by saying that when I used to present the Forbes list, uh, I used to tell people that I thought out of the 100 companies, there were 20 or 25 that had great looking visuals on the stock selection guide. Uh, I think that on this list of 50, that's uh, obviously half of the 100, I think on this list is 50, we might go as high as saying 30 or 35 that have great looking visuals on a, on a good solid stock selection guide. Uh, so I think that this list should serve you very well uh, for the next 12 months. And uh, I think that if we're still around 12 months from now, Mark and I probably will be uh, sharpening our pencils, maybe uh, refining our technique a little bit and coming up with a, another list uh, uh, 12 months from now. Yeah, sounds good. It's something that we've done for the better part of 15 years in one way or another. So I, it's... Uh, as Ken was saying, as we started this segment of the, the program, I mean, some of these companies, Mesa Labs is a great example. It's It's got a high return forecast now, but I think it's up like eight times, 800% over the first time that, that was mentioned in one of these sessions. And, you know, the other one I think we can tip our hat to maybe for the last time here, Bioreference Labs, ticker symbol BRLI. That That's a, a company that was held by so many of us that uh, we definitely discovered uh, – doing this sort of thing the better part of 10 years ago. So it can be a really, really rewarding thing to run into some of these companies and catch them when they're just coming out of the chute. All right, so let's go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and use the number one position company as my stock for tonight. Uh, it's a cage match with Ken, so my selection is going to be forward air. Again, relatively up straight and parallel when it comes to the historical look at uh, sales and earnings with a, a nod to what happened during the Great Recession. No surprise there. Uh, companies in the line of work of delivering things from point A to point B all suffered back in this time frame, and these guys were not immune, but they did recover nicely, and they've been back on the, the track to recovery ever since then. Company compares very favorably with another company that we've selected in the past, C.H. Robinson, 
ticker symbol CHRW. Um, C.H. Robbins is a little bit bigger, so it wouldn't qualify for the Forbes list. But again, this is a, a fairly formidable company. It meets the double digit sales growth forecast. You can see that I'm using about 12%. That's based on that red trend line through all the information there. Again, keep in mind that we do embed uh, the 2015 and 2016 estimates for sales and earnings as we as we calculate our trends. Uh, the net margin has been uh, pretty stable in that 8% range. And uh, with a, a PE ratio somewhere around 20, we do get a, a handsome uh, return forecast or projected annual return of 17 or 18% for this company. And uh, that's that's not, not too shabby these days. It might be down a little bit. The company is up um, here just in the last few days. Here's a look at the profitability characteristic of the company over time. Again, you can see the Great Recession shown here by this deep dive. Not as deep as the other guys, but still fairly deep dive during the back half of the, the Great Recession, and uh, you can see that they're they're settling into that uh, again seven to eight percent range. Uh, value line might ac might actually be a little bit higher in the long term forecast. P ratio has been hovering around 20, so anything in the neighborhood of 20 makes a lot of sense to me, and uh, so both of those characteristics are pretty stable. And uh, I really was you know. Since I'm in this cage match with Ken, I really wanted to to bring all all the energy and all the pizzazz and, and and flash and everything I could muster for tonight's session. You know, you know how Ken puts together those uh, presentations where he goes to investor relations and he clicks through and he gets you know presentations made by the company professionals and he you know he brings the highlights to us and tells us how it matters to our analysis and all those flashy <laughs> things. Well. Now, you know, with this company, I, I ran into a little bit of a roadblock, and that's not a, there's no pun intended there, but um, I, I discovered this is what they basically use to prepare all their presentations. And uh, I'm not kidding. When you dig in and try to find uh, flashy stuff on this company, you know, most of their stuff was outputted by that device. So uh, it can be a little bit tough, but, you know, that that's a... Uh, you can you can look at that both ways. Uh, frugality comes in a little bit there. Um, maybe reporting only what's required, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for companies who who don't overdo it with that kind of stuff too. So may, maybe the Underwood uh, isn't such a bad thing in this case. But, try writing a term paper on one of those, Mark. You uh, know, I, I, I recall the days when I, I that is a carriage return, by the way. For those of you that have never seen one, there's a carriage return up at the top of that thing. So wild stuff. Anyhow, this this is an is a world class delivery company, logistics slash delivery company. They are nationwide. They're headquartered again, not too far from Kim down there in southern Indiana. They're across the border over in Columbus, Ohio, but uh, they're pretty pretty geographically di uh, distributed, and uh, it's it's they're a major player, very successful and a very reliable firm in what they do. So I'll just close with just a, a nod to that Forbes list. They've been on the list for a few years. It says here 2007 through 2012. So they have been listed among the top 200 small companies for years. It's It's been a company that has uh, really executed their delivery strategy and been a, um, an excellent, well-managed company for years. And uh, they look pretty good right now. So I'm going to add forward air, ticker symbol FWRD, to the tracking portfolio for the roundtable. So with that, if we have, we don't, we can go ahead and take questions. We're doing fine on time, Ken, and you're going to be doing Polaris, so we'll, we'll be doing. All right, fine. I haven't got it. We're we're pretty well caught up with uh, uh, Jeremy and questions right now, Mark. We do have a couple for after we finish, but uh, for the most part, we don't have any questions on forward air. So let's move into Polaris, okay? Okay. Uh, yeah. We'll start by looking at the lines, and, and I'm pretty impressed by uh, what I see in these lines. Uh, I'm looking for the Great Recession, uh, and I really don't see that much of a disruption happening. Uh, a little bit of unevenness in the earnings uh, year to year occasionally, but generally the trend is up. Uh, and uh, th at, at about the same level as the revenues are growing, uh, I think this is a really opportune time to buy this company. And Mark, if you go to the next slide, please. 
And the reason that I think this is a really opportune time to buy this company is that I think there's a lot of confusion right now about what Polaris is doing and why its most recent quarter uh, didn't meet analysts' expectations um, uh, as strongly as many of the Polaris quarters have done. Uh, the, the major reason uh, for Polaris miss uh, was the foreign exchange uh, argument. You've heard this from company after company after company that operates in the uh, entire world rather than in just the United States. Uh, Polaris indicates that revenues were actually up 16% on a constant currency basis, but when you uh, take into account the great uh, expansion of the dollar in the last year or so, uh, then you lose some of that percentage growth uh, because uh, a cheaper foreign currency uh, means that you're making less when you sell overseas in dollar terms. Uh, I will tell you that as the quarters go by, if our currency, the dollar, if it stays relatively constant for more than a year, and it's been at oh a dollar ten, a dollar eleven, a dollar twelve, a dollar thirteen per euro now uh, for close to a year, if it continues at about that same rate, then the comparisons quarter over quarter for any company are going to become much easier as we proceed, and if the dollar decides to weaken and it's been strong for quite a while, so the, there's a possibility that the dollar will weaken. If the dollar weakens, then that will just uh, uh, give me even better comparisons quarter over quarter. I think this company has the opportunity in the next four or five quarters uh, to really do some extremely wild things as far as beating expectations. Now, you can see that instead of the revenues being up 16% uh, on a constant currency basis, uh, international sales uh, climbed just 1% and they would have been 18% if you just dealt with the international currency sales. North American sales were up about 7, off-road vehicles up around 3, snowmobiles up more than anticipated because they've been shipping the snowmobiles bills earlier to the dealers uh, to give people the opportunity to buy them in the third quarter rather than in the fourth quarter. Parts and garments were up, uh, global adjacent markets, including government and military contracts, uh, they were up. But here's the big market, uh, do, do a click again. Here's the big one, uh, and it's also the bugaboo that I think is bothering some people. Motorcycle sales. Remember the Polaris licenses, the Indian motorcycle. Uh, that revenue uh, was up 154%. And with this huge increase in sales uh, came some problems. They had some problems with a... Um, a factory that was doing some painting on bumpers. And that caused the uh, revenues to dry up just a little bit as they were unable to fill some of their orders and to ship some of the things that had been ordered uh, in various places where they sell the motorcycle. Now, they indicate that they have resolved those inefficiencies at their Spirit Lake paint system and that they've also acquired a new painting facility in South Dakota, which will come online and add to their paint capacity sometime in the fourth quarter, and that's what the, that's the quarter we're in right now. So these uh, glitches with the motorcycles, the company is very aware that they have to get fixed, and they're reporting that they've been able to fix most of those problems and they're increasing capacity. One more click, Mark. Uh, they also uh, narrowed their guidance, but they did not lower their guidance, and I thought that was uh, very indicative of management that was quite certain 
certain of what they were going to be able to do. Uh, their revenue guidance going forward was 10 to 12 percent, and now it's 10 to 11 percent. Their earnings guidance was also 10 to 12 percent, and now it's 11 to 12 percent. You can see that the analysts are following along with some very, very slight reductions in the next quarter numbers. Uh, that would be first quarter of fiscal 2016, and some reduction also in next year's uh, numbers. There, that's reduced about 35 cents on $8.67, so maybe a 3.5-4% reduction. Not enough for me to become unduly concerned about at this particular moment. Uh, I think that uh, I would have to see dramatic reductions in analyst estimates going forward uh, before I became unduly uh, concerned uh, about what the management was going to be able to do with their bottom line. Click again, please, Mark. Uh, I'm looking at the trends that are going on, and I think the sales trends for this company, uh, regardless of what the analysts are indicating, I think the sales trends are right on uh, point. Uh, they're moving the same they, as they've done for the last three or four years, and I'm very pleased with that. Earnings a little bit behind, but I've already talked about uh, the issues that they have with currency and the issues they have with their motorcycle division. Uh, I've estimated sales going forward at about 11%. Remember, the company has guided us to 11% as the high end for the next year. I'm trying to estimate out five years in the future, and I think that uh, somewhere between 10 and 12 is, is a very realistic number for five years into the future, and I've settled on 11. Uh, click again, if you would, Mark. I've put that 11% into the uh, preferred procedure, and I came up with 12.5% EPS growth. Uh, I did a little bit of adjusting on the net profit, a little bit of adjusting on the, the number of shares, and again, I'm coming into the same ballpark as the uh, company is setting for a one-year goal, and I'm trying to decide five years into the future. Uh, I think this is certainly a reasonable number. One more click, Mark. Uh, that gives me a return of somewhere in the 17 to 22 percent uh, uh, area down at the bottom of the SSG right down there. Uh, I'm very comfortable with buying a company that's in that kind of return. Notice that uh, I have an average PE of about 17 and a half, uh, maybe 17.6, something like that. I have adjusted for the most recent four quarters when I prepared the SSG. That's what that $7.07 .07 is doing uh, instead of the 665 that came from the most recent fiscal year. All in all, I'm comparing my SSG to get some validation and some, uh, I just want to, to understand whether or not I'm in the right ballpark. So I like to look at a number of different sources. And uh, of course, I took a look at Manifest Investing. One more click, Mark. Uh, here's the eagle for Polaris. Notice that Mark's indicating about a 20% uh, par value. That's right smack dab in the middle of of my uh, par number and my total return number. Uh, his PE is 17. I think I was using 17 and a half. Uh, so we're right smack dab in the same place with that. My sales number is a little bit less. Uh, I was estimating sales at 12 and a half rather than 15. Uh, so all in all, I'm uh, very happy with my SSG. It's a little bit more conservative than Mark's, but it's certainly in the same ballpark. Uh, one more click again. Uh, I'm not concerned by that yellow background up there. Uh, my par on the day that I captured this screen was around 7.4%, and the top of the sweet spot was at 17.4%. I don't mind a stock that's three or four points uh, above the top as long as it's carrying an extremely high quality rating. 
and this stock is carrying one of the highest quality ratings in the database at 97. When I look down at the bottom of the quality features, uh, I can see that it's getting maximum points for financial strength and for a comparison with industry sales growth numbers, it's getting above average points for EPS stability and it's getting above average points for a comparison with industry net profit margin as well. That 81.8 is a raw score and that raw score converts to a 97 uh, 97th percentile. That means that 97% of the companies in the database have a lower quality rating and only 3% have a higher quality rating than this particular company. I don't think there's any more slides, are there, Mark? Nope, that's it. Okay, so uh, I'm going to ask that uh, we take us another position in Polaris and uh, no matter who wins the cage fight, Mark, I think we're presenting two excellent companies this evening, and I'm not sure we're going to have an issue with either one, no matter which one the audience finally picks. So let me launch the poll and see where they come down. Well, it's, it's, it's clearly a battle between a fresh new idea and a, you know, recycled, uh, warmed over. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you are, are you lobbying right now for votes? Well, it's, it's election day here. I'm, I'm, that, you know, that, that hasn't I'm, served you real well in the past, you know. I know. Here we go. I've got my, we're gonna, my voted today sticker on. So okay, we're going to launch the the polls and folks, just use your mouse and uh, or your finger, however you control uh, your your pointer, and uh, give us a vote for either Forward Air or Polaris. Or tell us we're full of hot air. You don't believe either one of them should be added to the portfolio. Uh, we have 72% uh, voting, 75% voting, 80% uh, voting. Uh, let's keep the vote open. If we can get it to 90%, come on, let's get five or six more of you voting if we can. Uh, we're up to 87%, 86%, excuse me. If this was Chicago, I would have voted three times by now. I know. You would have had it all done by now, okay? So it looks like everybody that wants to vote has voted. So I'm going to close the poll, and I'm going to share the results. And, Mark, it was a well-fought race, but Polaris takes the the, the lead by uh, 7% here. Uh, oh, man. So I'll play Ben Carson to your Jeb Bush, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's got to be Trump and Carson. All right. I'll play Ben Carson to your Donald Trump. Uh, okay. But we'll have to see it then. So we're going to take two positions in Polaris and one position in Forward Air, and we'll see uh, what happens maybe a year or so from now oh, boy, uh, as we deal now. with this tracking. We're looking Tracking at one, portfolio. We're looking at one gigantic I told you so. Okay, uh, so let's see if we can. Uh, Mark, did you want to say anything at all about what Hugh was talking about or just, just keep moving here? I think we're good. We'll let Hugh speak for himself. I mean, uh, we are, Hugh and I will both be at the Seattle Puget Sound uh, invest, Investment Education Conference this coming weekend. So we should have a blast out there looking forward to spending time. There's a, a number of Seattle folks in the audience, and we look forward to spending our time with you, you guys this and, weekend. And I happen to know, Mark, it's not too late. If you live in the Seattle area and want to go to the conference and have not yet signed up, uh, I know that you can probably walk in on the day of the conference, or you can drop a note to Mike Torbenson, who's the president of the Puget Sound chapter, or Carol Fine, who's in that chapter, or almost anybody else that uh, is from Puget Sound, and they'll get you hooked up with uh, a registration. The same thing's true about the Mid-Michigan Stock Pickers Breakfast. Uh, that's next Saturday. Just drop me an email, uh, call me on the telephone. We'll save you a spot at the breakfast. Uh, the breakfast is always an awful lot of fun. It's a lot of laughter, a lot of good stock ideas, and uh, we're, we're getting you in by 8.30. We'll serve you a real, real nice breakfast, and then we'll have the whole thing wound up before noon. Mark, do you want to cover some of these questions that we have? Yeah, well, go ahead. Let's go ahead and... Uh... 
Okay. Mark, Claire would, has a question for you. She'd like to know, does Forward Air pay a dividend? Does Forward Air pay a dividend? Let me check here real quick. Yes, about 1%. Their dividend okay. yield is about 1%. Uh, Susan would like to know, why has Forward Air not moved into the medium company category uh, if it's been on the small list for seven years? Well, uh, probably because they started at $300 million and they've been steadily growing. I mean, you saw the lines on the, the historical data. Um, they, they are up towards the top end of the, the limits that we set, uh, very similar to the limits that Forbes had. So they've, they've almost run their, they've almost run their race in terms of this list. Uh, Donna uh, says predictions are for global warming and therefore no snow. Uh, don't tell that to anybody from Michigan, Donna, after we've lived through the last two winters here. Uh, my brother lives in Boston. Don't try to peddle that argument with him either. <laughs> so uh, I think that, that, uh, we're talking about climate change rather than global warming, and I think climate change is going to bring uh, a lot of snow to a lot of places uh, and a lot of places where there won't be snow that maybe is expecting snow. So I think there's probably going to be a market for snowmobiles uh, in, at least for the next 20 or 30 years. Joe would like to know, uh, he's a question for me, uh, is it time to buy buffalo uh, wild Wings. Uh, Joe, you must be reading your mind. Uh, I've been adding to my BWLD holdings uh, in a very methodical, uh, very slow manner. Uh, Buffalo Wild Wings did disappoint, but I didn't see anything in their earnings call to give me undue uh, shakes or anything about the company itself. Uh, I think that it's still a Solid business model with with a, a lot of growth potential, and I'm not abandoning abandoning Buffalo Wild Wings at this partic particular time. Uh, Gerald would like to know how are the ATV vehicles doing? Gerald, uh, that's the largest selling segment for uh, Polaris. Their ATV, their four wheel all terrain vehicles. Uh, but it's uh, not the fastest growing segment. It's not the slowest growing either. They're selling a lot of ATV vehicles to governments. Uh, so when you look at uh, a Polaris uh, balance sheet or you read their press releases, ATVs are counted in two different parts. Uh, one of them is just selling ATVs to the general public, and then there's the government section where they sell a lot of ATVs and other types of vehicles uh, to governments uh, throughout the world. So uh, they're doing fairly well, not nearly as well uh, as you could hear me say earlier as the motorcycle uh, session. Uh, Chidambaram, I hope I didn't really butcher that name, sir. Uh, says, where can I get a recording of these sessions? Uh, if you were to do a search on YouTube under Manifest Investing Roundtable or just under Roundtable, you would find most of our roundtables uh, are on YouTube and you can listen to them at your leisure. Uh, we are a small mom and pop uh, operation. Uh, Mark only has one paid employee and a couple of volunteers, so it takes us a little bit of time to get these uh, put up uh, on the uh, YouTube site, uh, but there's a lot of them up there already. Mark's showing you right now that uh, the June 2015, uh, for example, he's uh, pointing to, and there's a lot of other ones, so you can go to YouTube and see these. I think we also try to get them on the manifest site listed under the events tab. Is that right, Mark? That's true. If you go to manifest investing and you, you click through on the events, a lot of the old presentations are archived there also. And uh, for example, anytime that, that Kurt adds a presentation, um, the one from last month, the round table is right here. 
Okay, we're also trying to get them on the Manifest Facebook site, so we're, we're trying to give them as much uh, play as we possibly can. I was pleasantly surprised to see how many times some of our roundtables had actually been viewed. Uh, I expected to go in and see, you know, three or seven or nine, and, and some of these roundtables, for example, here's August 2015, and it's been viewed 152 times. Uh, since August, that's that's pretty neat. I, I enjoy seeing that. Yeah, it's picking up a little um, bit of traffic. In the the thrift savings plan ones have, have really been viewed a lot, and we're going to be serving that uh, a little bit more. But again, just to reinforce what Ken said, go to YouTube and just enter Manifest Investing Roundtable, and if you want to, search for a ticker as I've done here, and uh, it, it'll come up, and you can actually take a look at uh, Ken's original presentation of that rehashed, warmed-over idea that he had tonight. <laughs> uh, here, so. uh, I, I would comment that uh, these have been going up with the roundtable being two words with a space between them. And you know computers. If you type out roundtable as one single word, uh, a lot of times you're going to get uh, moved to places that aren't, uh, aren't what you're looking for. Uh, Marie would like to know, Mark, are you going to put the 50 small company dashboard on the public list on the manifest site? Oh, we definitely are. Um, I just haven't done it yet today. We finished the list today, so it will actually be out uh, tomorrow with $100 invested into every one of the 50. So there will be a tracking dashboard uh, available for the best small companies. Uh, Faith would like to remind everybody that once you get to one of the round tables, if you click the subscribe button on the YouTube site, then you'll get an email every time a new one is posted. So uh, if that's just a, a hint for those of you that are at YouTube on a regular basis, uh, subscribe to this particular channel, and then you'll get some uh, advice when a new one uh, ends up coming up. Uh, Henry would like to know, why don't we consider staple stocks like Kraft or Cisco or Whole Foods or Kroger or any of those stocks? Why don't we consider those uh, when we're looking for stocks to add to the tracking portfolio? Mark, anything at all? We do. We, we, we consider all of the different uh, opportunities in the spectrum. It's just a matter of whether or not they qualify at any given time. Um, Let's let's take a look at the, the the portfolio just for kicks. I think we probably do have some consumer staples in the portfolio. This will take a second because I have too many dashboards. Okay, while we, we don't. While Mark's doing. Okay, go on, Mark. Yeah. I'm just going to say we don't exclude uh, any sector. And while Mark's pulling that dashboard up. Uh, Herb would like to know, Mark, are you going to put that criteria somewhere where it's easily acceptable? Uh, uh, maybe attach a link uh, in the description of the uh, of the dashboard so that they can link right to a page that shows the criteria for the list. Yeah, there it'll be out as a as a standalone article. It'll be a sub article underneath the cover story for this month that'll be out in the next couple of days. So it'll it'll be there. Um, you know, we actually have we have CVS, Coca-Cola, Tyson, and uh, Whole Foods markets as representatives of consumer staples right now. So again, we haven't had a whole lot, but it 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 really is a matter of a lot of them have not bubbled to the top of our screens over the lifetime of the of the roundtable. Yeah. Uh... I forgot who asked the question, but Mark, can you Henry. show folks real uh, – Henry, can you show folks real slowly, Mark, how you uh, got to this particular uh, dashboard? Yeah, all, all I did was go in through the through our homepage, or you can enter that, uh, that link that we featured in the presentation, this longer link that you see up here. And this gives you that, that public dashboard uh, link. And then down at the bottom, again, you can see all the old presentations. Remember the night that Ken and I both came up with Universal Display at the same time, working independently? That's a two-time selection, by the way, 4,000. But as you, as you scroll down to the bottom of this, you get the sector diversification and the size diversification. And you can see we're pretty happy with that. 
I mean, we're basically split uh, three different ways into small, medium, and large. So we've got uh, a nice representation of faster growing companies, and that's borne out by that overall 10% growth rate too. But the, the sector diversification is the other pie. And again, you can actually see what companies make up the slices by going over them. In this case, there's four companies that have been selected from consumer staples. We got a lot of technology. Technology must have had a good month. <laughs> uh, Mark, I've cleared the question screen. Usually when I say that, another one pops up immediately. But for the moment, I've cleared the question screen. I don't have any hands in the air, and nobody is uh, chatting with me at the moment. So if nothing occur happens in the next 15 seconds here, uh, we can bring this session of the roundtable to a close. Uh, I really am happy that, that uh, and, and folks, Mark did 95% uh, of the, the work on putting that list together. I, uh, he gives me more credit than is due uh, for helping him on this particular list, but I was glad to do what I could do, and I think it's a great idea. If Forbes isn't going to do it, then somebody should step in with these ideas, and uh, there was a void, so we're trying to fill it. Uh, Mark, we're, we're, we're finished. Uh, Dean says, great work. Thank you, Dean. We appreciate all of that. And with no further ado, I want to say thanks, Kim, for helping us out this evening. And Mark, as always, uh, I appreciate what you do for the MidMichigan chapter and what you do for this investing community. Thank you so much. Well, you're most welcome. And everybody have a, a, a great, happy Thanksgiving. And we'll be meeting... Uh... The next roundtable will be just after Thanksgiving, so have a great uh, day with your families and, and enjoy the start of the holiday season. We'll be with you again on Monday, November 30th, so uh, put it on your calendar, and Natalie will be uh, sending you a reminder when it gets a little bit closer. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, and goodbye for this evening. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye.